Since the start of this event, we've had so many great educators talk about some of the problems in our current curriculum and how to fix them. And each problem was diverse in its own way and each answer was diverse in its own way. But is there a way to generalize all those problems under one big umbrella? To generate one big solution? Yes, there is. And that solution is the curriculum of life. You don't teach class 10th. You don't teach CBSE. You don't teach ICSE. No. You teach students how to live life, how to be happy, how to make money, how to invest. Have the curriculum of life. And what better way to truly debate about what that curriculum must be than a panel discussion? Firstly, we would be elated to invite on stage the moderator, Ms. Amrita Barman, the Deputy Director of Sunday Group of Education Institutions, a passionate educator who believes that it is only through education that India's destiny can change. Mrs. Amrita Barman has been associated with the Sunbeam Group for over three decades now. She holds a master degree in political science and has done her MBA both from Kolkata. Our next panelist is Major General S.S. Nair, the director of the Birla Education Trust. Born in Kerala in the year 1950, Major General S.S. Nair was educated in government schools and colleges. After post graduation in political science from Kerala University, he joined the Education Corps of the Indian Army in 1973 and served his country for 35 years. The next panelist, we have Mr. Deepak Sharma, the director of Rockwood School of Airport. The next panelist is Mr. Rashid Shafuddin, the headmaster of the Siraki School, Dehradun. Mr. Rashid has done his schooling at St. Xavier School, graduated from St. Stephen's College, Delhi, and a master's in history from the University of Delhi. He also has a degree in school management and international education from the University of Bath, the United Kingdom. The next panelist is Mrs. Deedika Bahuguna, the CEO of the Millennial Group of Schools. Accomplishment-driven leader at Delhi University alumni studied psychology, education and management and entrepreneurship from DSSC Wellington. Our next panelist and last panelist is Mr. Vishal Kanani, the principal of the Vidimoria High School, Panchgan. Very creative and many of the things around are creative. So, Good evening and Jay Hind to everyone. We've been waiting for this panel since morning. And the reason is that there have been so many things that, been, that have been discussed since morning that we've been discussing with each other. Oh God, I hope we are not really being repetitive, but we will try our level best to make it as interesting as we can. So I am actually remember of this very, it's an off-stated quote. Education is the passport to the future. For tomorrow, is only going to depend on what we do with our children today. So if that be so, I think the most important thing is the curriculum of life. And it was very interesting to hear these kids say all about happiness and everything and then an eye opener when they said, we also don't learn, we also have to learn how to make money. So, you know, there are so many things that go on in the minds of the children and the needs of the children. And I think in our classrooms, what we really need to do is make our children a better citizen for tomorrow, a happy child. So what is the curriculum going to be? That's what we're all going to be discussing. I'm going to be pushing them and picking their minds. We'll be talking about all aspects about the curriculum of life uh, from the role of the stakeholders, especially parents, to, you know, whether the previous uh, education system that we had, our own indigenous system, were they better than what we have today? And, of course, we would also be talking about if we have to really redesign, because in the morning we were talking about transformation, which I think we all are agreeing. So if you talk about transformation, then what is it that we need to probably keep out of the curriculum of today and what is it that we need to bring in for a curriculum which is going to be suitable to be a curriculum of life for the children of tomorrow. Uh, you know, this is something that we personally also go through in our own school, which I think all of us do. Whenever something goes right with our children, we say, wow, we have a good curriculum going. And when suddenly something doesn't really fall in place, we say, you know, we need to sit down, we need to mull, 
we need to discuss, we need to debate, and we need to redesign our curriculum. So I'm going to now be talking to my panelists and ask them what do they think about the curriculum of life. And my first question is going to be to you, General Nair. If you were to redesign or in fact design a curriculum which is relevant for life, what would be a part of it and can we really document something that is so broad-based and intangible? What are your views on it? Thank you, ma'am. Next time when we are in a panel discussion, off for the first panel discussion in the morning. <laughs> Because whatever that can be said we about... We need to carry favor with Ravi for that. Whatever that can be said about curriculum and schooling has already been spoken. I have made my notes, some notes. 90% of it is repetitive. So what I am going to speak about, you already heard. But still, I don't want to recuss. For me, a curriculum for life is more of an idea, it's a concept, it's an abstract. And personally, had I been a startup man like many of these youngsters who came and spoke to us, probably I would have worked in that direction. Having said that, since we are running formal educational system, there are formal institutions, there has to be some elements which are to be included and some of them which are to be excluded. While thinking about it, I have not been able to really list out what all can be included. Because the life includes everything. Now somebody says subjects are to be taught. If subjects are to be taught, subject has to become part of the curriculum. Whether physics, chemistry, maths, history, geography, geology, zoology, I don't know. But subjects are to be taught. But uh, is that the curriculum for life? No. More than that, we all talk about diversity, pluralism, inclusivism, internationalism, democracy, honesty. But the list is long. Is this form part of curriculum for life, or curriculum of life, or curriculum for life? I feel it will certainly be part of this. Our school makes us a very loose definition. I'll just read it out. Curriculum for life is focused on character traits such as honesty, on skills like understanding emotions and solving problems, or a core theme like identity development. Some programs use discussions as the primary learning activity, while others are movement-based or game-oriented. So there is no end to what can the life curriculum be. And the whole day we have been told, you know, we have been told we are living in that uh, VUCA world. If I don't talk about VUCA, people will say I am ignorant about the whole thing. Now if we are living in a VUCA world, a volatile, uncertain, ambiguous, confused, conflicting, contradictory, dynamic world, how can you make a curriculum for that? Can you text this down? Can you make a document? I don't think a document can be prepared. Luckily, I think the NEP has spared us. NEP has not given us a, you know, a curriculum for life. You know, mercifully, they have given us everything else. So I do not think that a curriculum for life can be prescribed in a formal form, especially in a country like India, where we have got millions of schools, majority of them cannot understand or distinguish the difference between a curriculum, a syllabus, a syllabus and a textbook, 
a textbook and the note given by the teacher, a note given by the teacher and the guidebook or Hindi mein kya kunji or whatever it is called. Now ultimately in majority of our schools the curriculum is their kunji or their guide. Now what do you prescribe there in such a context? Yes, we we may think about the curriculum for life. So, yes. Jai Nair, I'm sorry, I'm just oh, okay. in respect of time. I will leave it at that. But I think the, the, the thoughts were, were great because I remember this was his particular question. He said, I want to speak about whether we can really document something like this. And even I personally feel something so intangible and broad based is difficult to really put down. But yes, when we are talking about subject teaching, which really sounds uh, not very nice to speak about, but the fact is, it's not the subject you teach. It's what what you teach through the subject that probably prepares you for life. So let me go over to my next panelist, Gitika. So we have been speaking about what is it that should be in our in a curriculum, you know, uh, which is meant and going to be relevant for life. So in your curriculum, if you were to frame something or design something, would mindfulness find a space and uh, what would be the role of mindfulness? And I think we've been talking a lot about mindfulness, especially post-pandemic with so many distractions. Thanks, Samrita. So, I would a little disagree with the general, the, and I feel curriculum for life. Like, you know, we have been, uh, there's certain skills which you assume are there. When you feel that, you know, joy, happiness, these are certain things which we assume that we took it for granted that you, it is very innate and you experience it. But then Delhi government did frame a, a curriculum for uh, happiness. There is a happiness curriculum. So curriculum is actually a structure, it is a space, it is time. Curriculum is created so that you are able to create that opportunity for children to experience and for teachers to pay attention and focus to this area. So anything that we want, that we need to focus, we can build a curriculum around it. Although how it is going to be delivered, there is no structure. You know, it will differ, it will change. But then, yes, once you have documented, you know that these arenas need to come into our focus areas. Now, talking about mindfulness, now this is again, we were talking about emotional intelligence, we were talking about empathy and, you know, children being happy and wellness and social emotional well-being. Now how do we, we want this, now how do we get children to achieve this? Now that how is where mindfulness comes in. Mindfulness is the ability of the mind to focus on its present to focus on the present and be aware about what is happening within you. Your social emotional well-being, your feelings, your thoughts at the same time. And this is something I think is expected from everybody. We keep telling our children to be mindful when they eat, to be mindful when they study, to be mindful when they play. But then have we taught them how to be mindful? And mindful is a skill. Anything which is a skill has to be honed. You need to develop it. You need to build it. And how does that get built? Now for that there has to be, you know, there has to be an awareness, there has to be a need. And then you create opportunities like breathing and there are various techniques which are happening, which can be done in the school to develop mindfulness. And mindfulness is extremely important because what happens is if a child is focused on the present moment, he will do, and you know, he would be able to do that, you know, deal with that moment appropriately. He'll be able to, if he can regulate his emotions, he'll be able to take decisions or probably respond to a situation and not react to a situation. If the child is taught, if everybody is actually taught mindfulness and we are mindful and we have the skill in most situations which probably give rise to conflicts, which probably give rise to, you know, you're not able to build relationships or you're not able to concentrate, focus, all those issues will get solved. So in fact, 
you know, mindfulness, I don't know which category I would put it. Is it a life skill? Is it a coping skill? Or is it a survival skill? You know, if you look at it, it can be used in all situations. So it is a holistic skill. And, you know, learning, you know, it's a difficult task. It is difficult because you have to work on it and children have to be given various opportunities in the school to become mindful. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. And I like it when you say that, you know, you would like to document it and maybe just put it into a framework rather than, you know, uh, just document it by line by line. But I think frameworks work very well and we possibly need that in schools. And Mindfulness is a journey and has to be home. I think that was very, very well said. Over to you, uh, Deepa. Okay, so the question for you, and uh, which we did discuss it, I think it's something we've been talking very often again. What was our own education system like, the, you know, the pre-colonial, our own indigenous system? And when we speak about that, we speak a lot about the Gurukul system, right? So do you think that the Gurukul system of India was actually offering a curriculum for life and there's a lot that we should pick up from there if we are to design a curriculum of life. Good evening everybody. I think that's quite a debatable question first of all. And to put it up in like just two, three minutes can be a little difficult but I'll just try to put it up and especially uh, when the moderator is just briefly that we have to go by the watch. Uh, I, first of all, I, I think that all of us were sitting in the room, we, uh, I don't need to put much pressure about which system was good or better or the best. We all will come down to the conclusion maybe after a few minutes on that, but at least I know that all as an education, all as, as an educationist over here, we know that something was good which was happening in India. So, uh, Gurukul system was a system which was prevalent in India approximately somewhere around like since 5000 BC where a shishya used to approach a guru and ask for education and if the guru accepted then the child or the shishya used to spend somewhere around 14-18 years with the guru in his house and that was called a gurukul. What was the learning outcome of that? The learning outcome of, of that kind of system was an holistic development of a child. There were different skills when the child was running right from the beginning the education started. With the time, they used to pick up uh, topics like politics, warcraft, uh, medicines, and different different forms. The more important part was that they were learning the life skills along with the system of education right from the very beginning of their education career. And uh, they were spending time in the Gurukul that developed automatically a bonding between the Guru and the Shishya. So over here, the mentor, the guru became a most important part and everything was revolving around the guru. I'm sure we all can correlate to this thing over here because we all are educationists, we all are teachers and we understand how important it becomes if a child has that much faith, if the child is surrendered with that those feelings to us, what can be an outcome of this? Now the debate comes is that why do we need a Gurukul system? We, were so, we are so progressive now. We, why do we need to go back to that old system? Uh, the debate is not about whether with, obviously with time things have to change. There is a progressive thinking which has come into place. But we are talking about the systems. If we talk about our ancient system, if we go, go to our ancient Vedic scripts also, uh, those were not something which were like old. Those days people were studying stars. Uh, our ancient scripts talks about vimans. Our ancient scripts talks about medicines, surgeries. All things were there. So the system was progressive. Uh, got changed. We all know it got changed in around 1835 with Modern Education Act coming into implementation by Britishers. So, uh, education system was progressive that time also. I would like to uh, quote a shlok, a recited shlok. Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo Maheshwara, Guru Shaksha, Prama Brahma, Tasme Shri Guru Dev Namaha. I think we all know the meaning. The Guru was something which was kept next to God. With this feeling and dedication that the child is learning, we all know that the outcomes can be incredible. And that's where 
Now I ask you which system was better? Was the Gurukul system better or the current one? As a person who was asked this question, I think the Gurukul system was good with some progressive thinking, with some here and there, some changes. And I think if we can go back to that system, I think we can do wonders with our children. Thank you, thank you so much. And I really wonder whether we can go back to that system, but I think there's a lot that we could, and that, that was, I think, very uh, well said, that uh, it was very holistic, there's no doubt. And I think what we've been talking about since morning is the relationship between the teacher and the child, which personally I feel was just beautiful in a Gurukul system. So thank you, so well said. Uh, coming to you, Rashid, you're there from uh, a boarding school, and uh, it's always said, you want a holistic development, you want to prepare your child for uh, with a curriculum of life, just send your child to a boarding school. So Rashid, what do you have to say to that? Is that correct or incorrect? Good evening. I am the greatest champion of boarding school and I can tell you, starting my teaching career at 21, at Doom School and that's where I have been 11 years and then 8 years as a master of Selective International School. I haven't seen a day school and there have been many opportunities, there have been many talks, discussions, but whether I would survive in a day school and I can tell you that I can't. I think a boarding school, charm and life is something different and I am not championing boarding school or life, but I can assure you that given the, the interesting pandemic we had and probably who knows what um, in future, boarding Life is all body school going to be resurgent again, and I can see this. I can see the number of applications that have gone up. I can see the kind of uh, calls or discussion parents have had with me or interviews. But why would they want to send them to a boarding school? And it's very surprising that, they, and I'm not glorifying it or exaggerating it, uh, but after a year and a half or maybe a year at home, uh, when the students have come back to school, uh, they seem to be something missing. Even a regular student, in terms of their conversation skills, in terms of uh, their collaboration with each other, uh, they become a bit more uh, restrained to themselves, so on and so forth. So besides what uh, curriculum for life, uh, say, and so there are a lot of things that we talked about, and other panelists talked about, I think, uh, in my view, there are three major factors uh, that a boarding school that obviously will help you for life. What uh, is about risk taking? I am sure everyone will talk about how risk taking is important uh, at workplace as well as uh, in your life. And body school, you, you, you learn it very early. You start taking risk when you decide to bully someone. You take a risk when you decide to have a quiet smoke in a washroom somewhere. Or you take a risk when you decide to challenge a senior. Uh, but beyond that, you do lots of mountaineering, you do expeditions, uh, you form your own group, your own uh, strategies, and you challenge yourself. I think that's something that will help everyone as they move on. Uh, the second thing I will talk about is the sense of community. I think that is something that we all need and we will need uh, for time to come. It was in the ancient uh, world, Stone Age, right from Stone Age till now. So the boarding school it creates that sense of community bonded by love, affection and respect for each other. I think respect for diversity is going to be something that uh, we need to get into. And the diversity in terms of uh, what, uh, you know, what kind of uh, uh, respect we have uh, for each other, beliefs, views, uh, understanding and I think given the, uh, the political discourse of the country and around the world, uh, the narrative that is set around uh, what is accepted and what is not. And I think uh, that would be very, very important. And the last one, I would say, is about uh, collaboration and cooperation. And I think very important skills. And uh, in boarding schools, you do learn quite early, very fast. Both in terms of teamwork, in terms of uh, your relationship with peers, juniors, uh, with teachers, so on and so forth. 
Thank you. I think uh, I myself am a champion of boarding school. I think we have very many people here. And I loved it when he said, when you take the risk even to go take a smoke, I think that that happens and we might as well accept it. And what's important is how do we handle it and train our children. From, I mean, it's wrong to use that word, but their children should know what they're supposed to do, what they are not, and how to handle situations. You really learn well in a boarding school. Thank you so much, Rashid. Over to you, Vishal. So, We've all been speaking about curriculum and assessments have been a discussion, part of discussion of every uh, panel. So um, I think curriculum does have assessment as a part of it, but when you speak about a curriculum of life, can we assess it? And if you were to design an assessment for a curriculum of life, what would it look like? Thank you, Amritama. Uh, with all due respect and little experience what I have, I will start with a contradictory statement. Who are we to assess children? Like, really, uh, are we somebody to assess them because just, just because we are teachers, let's change it. We are not teachers uh, unless and until we we'll stop going inside the classroom as teachers. We cannot expect children to free themselves, to ask questions, to answer, to express. So, when we are talking about really big thing, curriculum of life, simple thing, how many of us were ready, how many of the schools had their SOPs ready for COVID before four years? No. But we all figured it out. And it's evident. You all are here. So we figured it out. Eventually all our children will figure it out. If we assess them, if we test them, if we tell them you are, you are high, you are good, you are not so good, it is going to make some effect on them. So, but obviously we are in school, uh, society as Kanan uh, have said, like who is the society? We are the society. So let's change. Let's change with small, small things. Like we, uh, in a beautiful town, Panchgani in Maharashtra, we have a residential school. We changed it. Not a boarding school. Why? Because children had that one word in mind. Boarding, you trouble at home, we will put you in boarding school. Change it. It's not a boarding school. It's a residential school where your parents and school together will try to make you a better person. Start with that. There are some cool things which we are doing at school. It's all our students, boys and girls, have picture as their uniform. Our teachers have the freedom to argue, to contradict with the authorities at their backs. Our children have the same kind of freedom. In fact, just uh, four days back, a student from 10, a girl, literally shouted at me for something. And I was so proud of her. Whatever is the Sorry, I just, reason, to, I, I just want to bring uh, you back to the question. Okay. And then assessment, yes. coming back to the point. And then, uh, I know, I mean, sir, saw it, but then she said, sorry, she understood, and I was happy with that. I was happy. And then, here we come to the part of assessment. CBSA has come up with some really good things. NEP has added into that. There is a holistic report card coming in place. As a school, I told there are certain things which we can add to make this assessment better and better. How we do it? Again, as sir said, I agree. Come, let's come together, collaborate, and come to that, not the best way of assessment, but something better where we will really help the children grow in free and confident individuals. Thank, Thank you. you. So you do feel that assessment should be a part of it, but then possibly the way we assess and what we really give as feedback to kids and how it really impacts them for life is possibly is what we really need to look into. So uh, for my to my panel, 30 seconds and uh, we just I just asked the same question actually first to you Gitika and then to Rajesh. The question is, 
your curriculum that exists in your schools today, right? What would you like to change, okay, in your curriculum to make it into a more suitable curriculum of life? I would like to probably reduce the syllabus, you know, which is mapped to NCRT, reduce the chapters because our curriculum is very beautiful um, and uh, it is quite mapped to NEP. The only thing is implementation becomes a problem because we don't have that kind of time. So we also have, uh, you know, your skill assessments and everything which has been there. Even like, you know, for mindfulness, there are these yoga practices which are there, but it needs time. So that 40 minute and that six hours, so I think boarding school, why we are able to build all that, is because you have enough time. If we want NEP to be implemented, you need either day boarding or you need boarding schools. Because six hour schools will not be able to realize the vision. So and we've seen it. you feel possibly reduction of a little bit of syllabus it's may help it is a good concept. More time. Yeah, more time for concepts, more in-depth uh, understanding because you have projects but then they are rushed. So, and then you have so many chapters. So I think that should happen. We are waiting for NCF to be there. Okay, yeah, yeah. so time. Rush it. So there are two things that uh, I have started this year and I think uh, there is something which is important. One is that uh, we decided to create a curriculum of respect. Uh, we felt that, uh, there, you know, given the difference that we have in society and in the country, it's important that uh, we start respecting each other's views and diversity. Uh, so the school counselor, this, the prefectural body, uh, colleagues, they sat together and they created three layers of how respect should be disseminated in uh, treatment with each other, uh, with juniors and seniors also. Second thing uh, which uh, I did and I think uh, very close to my heart is also what we call curriculum of gratitude. Uh, our students say uh, not only students... So you know what, I'll have to stop you but I think those two words that you spoke about, respect and gratitude, excellent. Done. Thank you. <laughs> okay, over to you, uh, Vishal. So, you know, for a, a curriculum of life, parents, how do you take them on to make it relevant? What's their role? Uh, definitely, parents play an important role. So we have to onboard, uh, we have to train, there was a point discussed uh, earlier, we have to train parents and we have to just, as teachers we are coming out of this race, let us make parents understand that assessments are to understand them but we have to onboard them properly and then uh, give them uh, the picture, better picture of tomorrow that yes, he or she is going to do wonderful things in future. So we have to onboard them. That's very important. <laughs> Role of parents, especially when it comes to curriculum of life or curriculum for life, they, are, they have the decisive role. If any one of us is under the misconception that we can make 100% change in the school, we are wrong. By the time the child comes comes to this, joins us, probably in our residential system, but the child is already 11 or 12 years old, certain life values, life norms, certain fundamental things are already learned. Therefore, the sub-minimal messages which happen in the family what is the family, the behavior, the pattern of the family? What is the dining hall behavior of the family? What is the study room behavior of the family? All those things are very important. School will find it very difficult to undo those things and uh, you know, change the value systems of a child. Parents have got a major role in this. Absolutely. Agree. For you, Deepak, values and ethics do they form a very important part of the curriculum of life? Values and ethics. Um, I was listening to the speakers in the morning and one of the keynote speakers gave a very impactful line in the morning which was the 19th century belonged to the Britishers, the 20th belonged to the Americans and the 21st is going to be us Indians. Very impactful line. 
That can only happen if our values and ethics are in place. Even if you become superpowers and your ethics and values are not in place, you don't have integrity, you don't have the right morals, uh, a strong character, uh, things cannot be working out. And the seeds can be sown at the school level. This cannot happen that once you are grown up and then suddenly these things can be imbibed in you. So value and ethics plays the most important role in the character building of not only children or individual but for the nation also. Thank you. So India can be jumping if our values and ethics are in place. Uh, any questions from the audience? Yes. Sir, I don't think so. We need a book for that. First of all, we, I think what we need is that the, all the organization and the education system which are running, they need to have within their own system. Sir, One of the, and I think, I think being a role yeah. model is the most important thing exactly. for a teacher, you know, besides, I'm sorry, I just put it in. But for, and these things start, right, starts right from the student when they enter the gate. So we have to teach students about gratitude, we have to teach them about uh, feeling of belongingness, we have to te te teach them about the social development, the emotional development, with that we need to teach about empathy. And this needs, this is a, a whole day process. Ekalapa has had gratitude towards Dronacharya, was it right? Uh, I think the Colonel Shekhar will take one more session on that by saying politically correct or incorrect. <laughs> because some of our schools wanted a value education book. So, because there's no book on value education. So, we have actually integrated SDGs. We said these are universal values and let people think about and start doing. So, that is... <coughs> there is a book called The Little Book of Values. Okay. It's a very slim book. Okay. You have it all there. There are 22 values. So the chapter for each value. Get it. It's called The Little Book of Values. And I think it might be... Yeah, it, they can't be a period. It's a culture. It's a culture. And Ramoji wants to say something on values. May I ask a politically very incorrect question uh, connected with the, the curriculum of life? There is no doubt that children, when they pass out from school, they'll go into college. And we need to educate them because they have to make choices. Are we ready to? To tell them that don't do drugs. Obviously, we all say don't do drugs. But do we educate them that if there is a choice, don't do chemical but do organic? <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready to tell this? But do we need to tell or we don't? <laughs> Politically incorrect. Politically incorrect. <laughs> Politically incorrect. But we need to. Do we tell them about alcohol? Do we tell them that don't take one can of strong alcohol, strong beer? It is better to take 100 ml of wine because of the difference in the alcohol percentage, do we inform them? Again, is that politically incorrect? But these choices are life situation. Don't really disagree with you. I don't think any of us, any of us really disagrees because if you are really preparing our children for a tomorrow where well, these are the situations they are going to face and they are going to make choices. Um, so, uh, Sandeep ji has been pretty kind to us. Thank you so much. You've been kind. But uh, at the end, of, uh, you want to say something? Just Sorry. one line as said. Please, uh, please, please. Totally agree. And as we were talking about curriculum of life, and ma'am rightly said, let's start documenting and open-ended. We can add points, we can remove points as time progresses. But as sir said, we have to 
tell our children about consequences. We have to educate them. This is very important. Absolutely. Agree. So, um, of course, I think we've all been speaking a lot about curriculum of life in many different ways and we, um, I think this is another one quote that I want to end with. Uh, again, talking about a situation. So, if someone is going down the wrong road, he doesn't need motivation to speed him up, but what the person really needs is good education to turn him around. So if education and good education, preparing the child for, a, for life is the Sakha, the Sarthi, the pole star, I think we all educators need to get back and even over here really debate and think about what we need to keep, what is the redesigning of our curriculum to make it a relevant curriculum for, of life. Thank you so much each of the panelists. I thought you were an excellent and an excellent audience. Thank you, Jeremy.